episode 45. Why do you have to keep changing owls? Ron asked in a low voice. Hippie will attract too much attention, said Hermione at once. She stands out. A snowy owl that keeps returning to wherever he's hiding? I mean, they're not native birds, are they? Harry rolled up the letter and slipped it inside his robes, wondering whether he felt more or less worried than before. He supposed that Sirius managing to get back without being caught was something. He couldn't deny either that the idea that Sirius was much nearer was reassuring. At least he wouldn't have to wait so long for a response every time he wrote. Thanks, Hedwig, he said, stroking her. She hooted sleepily, dipped her beak briefly into his goblet of orange juice, then took off again, clearly desperate for a good long sleep in the owlery. There was a pleasant feeling of anticipation in the air that day. Nobody was very attentive in lessons, being much more interested in the arrival that evening of the people from Bobetons and Durmstrang. Even potions was more bearable than usual, as it was half an hour shorter. When the bell rang early, Harry, Ron, and Hermione hurried up to Gryffindor Tower, deposited their bags and books as they had been instructed, pulled on their cloaks, and rushed back downstairs into the entrance hall. The heads of houses were ordering their students into lines. Weasley, straighten your hat! Professor McGonagall snapped at Ron. Miss Patil, take that ridiculous thing out of your hair. Parvati scowled and removed a large ornamental butterfly from the end of her plate. Follow me, please, said Professor McGonagall. First year's in front. No pushing. They filed down the front steps and lined up in front of the castle. It was a cold, clear evening. Dusk was falling, and a pale, transparent-looking moon was already shining over the Forbidden Forest. Harry, standing between Ron and Hermione in the fourth row from the front, saw Dennis Creevy positively shivering with anticipation among the other first years. Nearly six, said Ron, checking his watch and then staring down the drive which led to the front gates. How do you reckon they're coming? The train? I doubt it said Hermione. How then? Broomsticks? Harry suggested, looking up at the starry sky. I don't think so. Not from that far away. A port key, Ron suggested. Or they could apparate. Maybe they're allowed to do it under 17 wherever they come from. You can't apparate inside the Hogwarts grounds. How often do I have to tell you? said Hermione impatiently. They scanned the darkening grounds excitedly, but nothing was moving. Everything was still, silent, and quite as usual. Harry was starting to feel cold. He wished they'd hurry up. Maybe the foreign students were preparing a dramatic entrance. He remembered what Mr. Weasley had said back on the campsite before the Quidditch World Cup. Always the same. We can't resist showing off when we get together. And then Dumbledore called out from the back row where he stood with the other teachers, Ah, unless I am very much mistaken, the delegation from Beaubetons approaches. Where? said many students eagerly, all looking in different directions. There! yelled the sixth year, pointing over the forest. Something large, much larger than a broomstick, or indeed a hundred broomsticks, was hurtling across the deep blue sky toward the castle, growing larger all the time. It's a dragon, shrieked one of the first years, losing her head completely. Don't be stupid, it's a flying house, said Dennis Creevy. Dennis's guess was closer. As the gigantic black shape skimmed over the treetops of the Forbidden Forest, and the lights shining from the castle windows hit it, they saw a gigantic powder-blue horse-drawn carriage the size of a large house soaring toward them, pulled through the air by a dozen winged horses, all palominos, and each the size of an elephant. 
The front three rows of students drew backward as the carriage hurtled ever lower, coming in to land at a tremendous speed. Then, with an almighty crash that made Neville jump backwards into a Slytherin fifth year's foot, the horse's hooves, larger than dinner plates, hit the ground. A second later, the carriage landed too, bouncing upon its vast wheels, while the golden horses tossed their enormous heads and rolled large, fiery red eyes. Harry just had time to see that the door of the carriage bore a coat of arms, two crossed golden wands, each emitting three stars, before it opened. A boy in pale blue robes jumped down from the carriage, bent forward, fumbled for a moment with something on the carriage floor, and unfolded a step of golden steps. He sprang back respectfully. Then Harry saw a shining high-heeled black shoe emerging from the inside of the carriage. A shoe the size of a child's sled, followed almost immediately by the largest woman he had ever seen in his life. The size of the carriage and of the horses was immediately explained. A few people gasped. Harry had only ever seen one person as large as this woman in his life, and that was Hagrid. He doubted whether there was an inch difference in their heights, Yet somehow, maybe simply because he was used to Hagrid, this woman, now at the foot of the steps and looking around at the waiting, wide-eyed crowd, seemed even more unnaturally large. As she stepped into the light flooding from the entrance hall, she was revealed to have a handsome, olive-skinned face, large, black, liquid-looking eyes, and a rather beaky nose. Her hair was drawn back in a shining knob at the base of her neck. She was dressed from head to foot in black satin, and many magnificent opals gleamed at her throat and on her thick fingers. Dumbledore started to clap. The students, following his lead, broke into applause too, many of them standing on tiptoe the better to look at this woman. Her face relaxed into a gracious smile, and she walked forward toward Dumbledore, extending a glittering hand. Dumbledore, though tall himself, had barely to bend to kiss it. My dear Madame Maxime, he said, welcome to Hogwarts. Dumbledore, said Madame Maxime in a deep voice. I hope I find you well. On excellent form, thank you said Dumbledore. My pupils, said Madame Maxime, waving one of her enormous hands carelessly behind her. Harry, whose attention had been focused completely upon Madame Maxime, now noticed that around a dozen boys and girls, all by the look of them in their late teens, had emerged from the carriage and were now standing behind Madame Maxime. They were shivering, which was unsurprising given that their robes seemed to be made of fine silk and none of them were wearing cloaks. A few of them had wrapped scarves and shawls around their heads. From what Harry could see of their faces, they were standing in Madame Maxime's enormous shadow. They were staring up at Hogwarts with apprehensive looks on their faces. "'Has Carter arrived yet?' Madame Maxime asked. "'He should be here any moment.' said Dumbledore. Would you like to wait here and greet him, or would you prefer to step inside and warm up a trifle? Warm up, I think, said Madame Maxime, but the horses, our care of magical creatures teacher, will be delighted to take care of them, said Dumbledore. The moment he has returned from dealing with a slight situation which has arisen with some of his other charges. Scrouts, Ron muttered to Harry, grinning. My steeds require forceful handling, said Madame Maxime, looking as though she doubted whether any care of magical creatures teacher at Hogwarts could be up to the job. They are very strong. 
I assure you that Hagrid will be well up to the job, said Dumbledore, smiling. Very well, said Madame Maxime, bowing slightly. Uh, will you please inform this Hagrid that the horses drink only single malt risky? It will be attended to, said Dumbledore, also bowing.